What's good, everybody? If you're here, you know why you're here. We know why you're here. I'm Joey Powell. With me, as always, the venerable, most lauded, talented Thomas Ashley Esquire uh, is here to to <laughs> to chuck deuces, but also to to help me keep the show on the rails. You're listening to another edition of the Forty Club here on InsideCarolina.com. We appreciate you joining us. You know the rules of this one. We really just like to uh, allow people that have made that 40-year decision to go to Chapel Hill. We allow them to come on and tell their story. And, and Tommy and I try to keep it on the rails, but really it's about our guests. And tonight uh, is no different. We've got a really unique story to be told, but it can only be told by this guy himself. You'll recognize him uh, You'll recognize him as a, a former defensive back, one of the original Rude at, at UNC back in the days with the uh, – in, in 1997 through 2001, uh, led the Tar Heels and in interceptions in 99 and 2000, uh, was recruited by Mac Brown, but ended up playing in the Peach Bowl and had a pick in the Peach Bowl in 2001 for John Bunning. Um, just an absolute all-star in Carolina lore. We're going to hit some of the highs of his career as well. But you may also recognize the relevance here. He is the father of one of UNC's most highly regarded recruits that you will be seeing his name if you haven't already, all over inside Carolina in the weeks and months and years to come. Mr. Errol Hood. Errol, how you doing, man? Doing great. I'm doing great. Well, Tommy and I appreciate you joining us. And we're, we're going to start this out as far back as, as you'll let us go. But what do you remember the most about being in high school in West Caldwell the first time you ever talked to one head coach named Mac Brown? Man. I remember Coach Brown telling me I was going to play running back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I remember the most. Yeah, I mean, Earl, we're going to bring you in and going to play running back and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I got into Carolina. My, came to Carolina my freshman year and, I, and never ran the ball. <laughs> the only time I touched the ball was when I was running it back to the running back drill from DB. So that's the one thing I remember the most. How did, how did that, how did that go down? I mean, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I want to take you where you're leading us. Did, did you show up and immediately they just was the running back room too full? Did they see something in your skill set? Did they feel like your athleticism was just too unbridled to be used in, in, in the backfield? You know, I don't know. I guess I was a little slow with reading the signs because um, when I came to on my official visit, Dre Bly, um, who's a Defensive back coach there, he was my, he showed me around. I should have thought, wait a minute, why is not a running back coach? Why <laughs> back coach? But I was so excited, I didn't even care. You know, so me, Dre Bly and I, we um, formed a bond immediately there, you know. So in my mind, I was a running back, I was a quarterback in high school, just like Caleb, ran mm -hmm. the ball a lot and did the same type things. And so in my mind, I wanted to play running back. But I guess, you know, Coach Brown, you know, he he's a great, you know, he, he's great at, you know, putting you and placing you where you belong. Mm -hmm. And it worked out. So no hard feelings there. I love it at the time. You know, I would like to um, have ran the ball. But when I got there, you know, I saw big Ebenezer, Ekebon, Greg Ellis, all those guys. And I was like, you know what? This defensive back doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smart decision right there that would end up probably uh, really paying off for you. So you mentioned you were a quarterback. Uh, in high school, um, and, you know, so I'm sure you guys ran the ball a little bit. I don't know a lot about the offense that West Caldwell was running in, in 95, 96, 97. Um, but you played a little bit of DB too. So which one did you prefer out of those two? I know you said you came in and wanted to be a running back. Did you, you know, did you like playing defensive back better? Did you like playing quarterback better? Well, in high school, I played defensive back on like special, special situations. Okay. You know, we're down – uh, we needed to, you know, they, we knew they were going to pass. He put me in at safety. You know, sometimes they put me in a corner. I didn't really know how to play it much, but I could, I played basketball really well. So I could guard anybody. And I was just confident enough to just say, Coach, let me do anything. I'll drive the bus to the game if you let me. <laughs> so um, that was that. But I preferred, you know, I wanted to the ball. Um, oh. Hello? Sorry. You still there? Hey, roll with it, man. Yeah. Um, I wanted to run the ball, you know, um, and that was what I trained for all summer, you know, just to be a running back and um, just to get in there and kind of just show what I had. But, you know, God and Coach Brown had other plans for me, and I met a great defensive back coach named Coach Case, and it just changed my life. From day one, he made me feel comfortable, you know, so 
I yeah. guess that's where I ended up, and that's where I'm happy it's at. Yeah, Dre's mentioned, talked about Coach Case a lot and, and what he meant to you guys and all the guys that played under him there. Uh, when you come in, and, and this is something that uh, Mac was able to do back then um, and really hadn't done – as much second time around as you had the opportunity to red shirt how yeah. how how difficult was it or how difficult is it for a guy that, that's come in that's played a ton in high school that's done it all in high school and you come in and you have to sit and practice and be the guy that they beat up on a little bit in practice um and not have that opportunity to get on the field how difficult was that for you well being that i switched positions it was actually awesome you know, just to be able to learn. I mean, when I came in, Carolina was in the top 10. Um, they had one of the top defenses in the nation. I mean, you had cornerbacks, Dre Bly, Robert Williams, um, Omar Brown, um, Joe Molegans, all those, Reggie Love, all those guys that I could learn from. And they they had a bond that was like no other. And and they taught, you know, the watching Dre Bly, you know, um, in practice um, was – so funny because Dre Bly was never a practice player, but he always made plays. He was a gamer, you know, and, um, but the other guys, you know, and Dre would always talk, call me young rude and made me feel like, you know, he was my big brother, you know? So, and I just watched them and they motivated me because I wanted to be a part of what they had going on at UNC. So, um, you know, coming out of high school, of course, you know, you plan every down, you know, you're the man in your school, the man on your team. And whenever you get there, you realize you're, you're just as good as someone else. There's a lot of people better than you there. So it was tough, but like I said earlier, it was really exciting and awesome because I, you know, I was able to, to get the late, to know the lay of the land, um, figure out how to practice there, um, how to learn my position, how to go, you know, how to practice and go to class. You know, um, I was a people person, so I was able to meet a lot of people, a lot of friends. I mean, it was awesome, man. So, you know, I like the red shirt. So sort of chaos happens after that year. Mac leaves. Um, you got upheaval. Uh, Tobish is there. Freshman year, you played a little bit. Uh, you played in all the games, played in that bowl game. But let's talk about sophomore year, because I think that's when you really um, started being the guy at Carolina that people remember. Um, and there's one particular game that stands out. We could talk about a lot. But I want to go ahead and jump in before Joey jumps in on you it. You know, know he's going to steal my cookies right here. <laughs> and I, uh, I used to have the paper. I've got it somewhere. And I've talked to David Bomar oh, okay. more than once. <laughs> and, and David credits you on that. And he just came to clean up. Talk about you've had a rough season. You got running backs playing quarterback. All that's going on. But you play NC State in Charlotte that year. Tell us about how that game was and what that game meant for you guys, especially you being from North Carolina, to go up against NC State and Charlotte and how it ended. Well, first of all, we came into the game just trying to beat a rivalry. They came in the game trying – if they won, they went to a bowl game. So even though we were in a position where the game win or lose didn't really mean anything in terms of placement, standings, we had an opportunity to send them home, you know, and – um we're fighting for our coach, you know, coach Tor Bush at the time was, um, had taken the job and, um, after Mac left and we were just fighting for him. We wanted him to stay there and be there and, and everything like that. So, man, it was just going in, you know, the rivalries is NC state. It's all you hear is the battle of the state and, and that, that red and white that just sticks in your mind, like, uh, but whenever we stepped on that field, you know, Coach Tor, I remember that week. I remember one thing Coach Donnie Thompson used to tell us all week. And the one place like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he, he preached that all week long, you know. And so when we came on that field, you know, um, it was just a different feeling. Like the records was gone. You know, it was all about what we had to do that day. And my roommate at the time was the quarterback, was the running back that was put at quarterback, Dominique Williams. <laughs> so, he, you know, you're talking about nervous. This dude was really nervous, you know, but he had to perform. That's why, you know, whether you came there as a defensive back, a, a quarterback, a running back or whatever, whatever you, they call you to do, you have to do it. 
you know, and I mean, he was really nervous, man, but I had a, a blast there. I got put out the game early because I ducked my head and made a, you know, poor decision in terms of tackling, but, uh, you know, I was able to come back and, um, you know, they were having, they were having a lot of success with a lot of plays, you know, so when we, it came, when it got in the end zone, I remember we had a, um, Julius Peppers jumped off sides, gave them another shot. We called a timeout and coach Torbush and coach case, all of those guys was preaching where the, and according to where the ball was, remember, watch Chris Coleman, you know? So I'm just like, forget this. I got him. You know, they put me on Chris Coleman and, um, when he motioned across, I knew what he was going to do. I knew that he was going to go across and come back, you know, so I was right on the play. As soon as he caught the ball, I was there and I was holding on for dear life. And then David Bomar came in and, you know, helped me out. And we just made a great play, man, and just changed the, 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 the turnaround of our season. It's never a bad time to beat NC State, especially when yep. you keep them from going to a bowl game. Uh, I, I was there in Charlotte. I was down in that end zone. Um, one of the epic finishes. I mean, it was just it typified State Carolina rivalry right there, right? It was – it didn't matter records like you mentioned. And, yeah, it, it was a, a pretty crazy ending. But Bomar definitely gives you all the props on that play. He was just – And look, man, that, that field is 100 yards long. It's not – it's not 99 yards and, you know, a couple of feet. It's 100 yards, and y'all made use of every single bit of it on that play. I think what he was down at, what, the one-foot line, the two-foot line? Yeah, it, it was right there. Yeah, six inches. Whew. Born, you know, so um, it was a great play. You know, you know, we – team, teamwork. We, we both made the play. We got it done. We won the ball game, and, and now we get to talk about it for the rest of our lives. And vice versa, Chris – you know, I played with him in Canada, and um, that's all we talked about is that play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I'm walking around my head held high because we won that play. So it was just a little awkward, but felt good. <laughs> hey, whatever it takes. That's uh, Living in North Carolina, beating NC State, you're going to see them all over everywhere. That's the cool thing about doing these podcasts is we talk to guys like you and – most of the time people you played against you still see on the regular and still have opportunities to to cross paths with those guys uh, cousin julius patterson he was a safety for the state and, so and you can always say uh two and oh in charlotte against nc state <laughs> your uh your uh, sophomore year was a good one co-defensive mvp tell us about your junior year what stands out there you started all 11 games. You had a bunch of tackles, broke up some passes. Only two interceptions, but you still led the team in interceptions. What do you remember most about that junior season at Carolina? Well, you know, um, the most – the one thing I remember the most about that season was, you know, I had to take people back, but to Clemson. Um, homecoming. We were – they came in ranked, what, number seven or number three? And we were looking for a win. And, I mean, we practiced hard. You know, um, my stock was high. The receiver coming in was Rod Gardner. His stock was high. Um, everything was good except for, like, um, I was adopted, and um, my mom didn't really come to many games. And that was the game that, you know, she came to. And it just – she and I had a little, little misunderstanding that game, and my mind was done. Mm -hmm. that that was one of the biggest games that I was going to play. And I just was mentally wasn't in the game. And of course, Rod Gardner was mentally in it. He had seven catches, 183 yards, three touchdowns. Now, when you remember all that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a game changer, man. And I remember one particular play um, from one of my teammates, you know, Rod just scored like his second touch, third touchdown. Coach Casey came to me and he was like, look, look around. If I put anybody else in, I have nobody else to put in but you. You either going to get out of your funk or you're going to um, continue to get beat down. You know, so <laughs> when he wasn't taking me out. I was wanting him to take me. Normally you get beat on a couple of touchdowns. Coach would place you and stuff like that. You're like, all right, cool. Somebody else can take this. But now Coach Casey's like, no, you're going to take this. So um, my my great teammate, he he's gone now. His name is Quincy Monk. Quincy came over to me 
And I mean, I, I was a little down and he put his head on me and said, look, man, I love you. We all got confidence in you. You know, you got here because of the man that you are. You got this. You can do it. And for some reason, it, I mean, I didn't get burned anymore. And I, my level of confidence went up, you know, just for that. Him coming over, you know, giving me that little hugs and I got you, man. We're here. We love you. We have confidence in you. So I will always remember that about Quincy, you know, even though he's not here today, man. So that's the one thing that stands out to me about that season. I hate it's a negative, but, you know, you learn from it. You know, I'm able to bounce around, joke with my son, my smaller son, younger son, Kellen, about that game because it's on um, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people, they'll say, man, your dad played this game, played that game. Kellen will remember that game. Um, <laughs> so he played against Clemson, man. He got burned. He did that. And the other, I'm like, I'm your dad, right? Let your son <laughs> roast you, man. That's messed up. <laughs> yes. You know, so I had to go through and find some games with some highlights to show him. He's like, so we got about Clemson. <laughs> Like Clemson is not a pushover. Absolutely. And that is quintessential Quincy Monk right there. And yeah. that's why people love him so much. Um, and he it definitely a huge loss when he moved on. Um, let me – I was going to throw it back to Joey, but I want to ask you something relevant to what you just talked about, and that's what you had going on off the field. And I listened to Mac Brown earlier this week. Um, it could have been a last week's press conference, whenever it was, talk about how he wants to get to know his players to understand what's going on because everybody's a person, everybody has things going on, and you want to know about them and know what makes them tick, know what's bad or good. And he talks about going around the room now and asking people to tell um, something that their teammates might not know. What does that mean for – you as a former guy under Mac, but also you having sent your son there to be there and play for Coach Brown. How, how is that? Um, well, just what does that mean for a dad and for a player to have a coach like that? It just means that he's a people's player. He's a people's coach and that he cares more about my son's all around game than just him you know, being a running back. He wants to know every part of you so he can know how to coach you. That's the one reason why I'm excited, you know, that Caleb is playing for Coach Brown is because I know that Coach Brown is going to get every ounce of talent out of my son. You know, every ounce. It's almost like greedy ounce. Like, I want every <laughs> ounce, every inch of talent that you have, you know. And if it starts with getting to know, you know, your mom and your daddy, your uncle, your cousin, your sister, your brother, you know, whatever. I need to know this because I need to know why you do the things that you do. And you want a coach like that. You want somebody that's going to care about you as an individual versus you as just an athlete. And I love that about Coach Brown. Yeah, you know, my son, a real quick story. I went, I went to Carolina last week. Um, my fiance and I, we were on um, about to go to vacation. I was going down first. And so I went down on Thursday to watch Caleb practice watched them practice and everything, you know, and at the end of the practice, um, I came down on the field after a little situation on the elevator, got scared, you know, <laughs> but um, I got stuck on the elevator. I thought my life was over. You know? <laughs> I, I thought my life was over. I was on the elevator stuff for like 10 minutes. Caleb said it was more like two, but I promise you it was like 10 minutes. I thought my life was over. So was when this I, a, which it, elevator was this now? Cause I don't want to get on that. Out. Yeah. Like, I need to warn you about it. Like, it's on the and it's on the little rafters towards the um, soccer field, the lady soccer field. You don't go down the elevator. I'm telling you, it, you know. Let me come. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a safe spot, man. You're okay. <laughs> I was sweating and stuff. You know, I thought my life was over. The first person I looked for after that was Mac Brown. I wanted to tell him about this elevator. <laughs> <laughs> so. We went over there, and I'm talking to Coach Brown. That's first, first thing I say, hey, look, we need to talk about this elevator. I was stuck forever. <laughs> you know, he's like, oh, girl, Corey got you out of there. And I'm like, well, I didn't hear anybody around. I thought no one. I thought everybody left. So we're talking, and the conversation, you know, Caleb's there watching everything we say, right? So at Coach Brown, at the end of the conversation, Coach Brown hugs me and tells me he loves me. And so I'm too busy thinking about this elevator. I don't even <laughs> hear anything that he says and I'm like all right thank you coach <laughs> and so I walk away right Caleb looking at me like really 
I didn't even know that, I, that he said that to me. So I'm talking to my kids later on that night. And they was like, Dad, Caleb called us like, can you believe Dad? Coach Brown hugged Dad and gave him and told him he loved him. And Dad was like, all right, thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was funny to me, man, because I didn't even know. But Coach Brown is like that. Every time I see him, he's like, I love you. You know, his former players, like, he wants us to come back and just be a part of the program, man, and just, you know, share our stories with the team and just be there. Be Our presence is important. Uh, I mean, listen, he's <laughs> – He's got a, a top 10 team that he's worried about right now. But you got more important things on your mind, mainly like death trap elevators that are trying, to, trying to take your life from you as you're going to visit your son. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the fact that that's, uh, that's what got you shook, but I appreciate your honesty. Um, okay. So I, I want to hit one more thing before we'll let you go into full dad mode, okay? Uh, 2001, John Bunning shows up. Uh, you guys have an amazing defense. I mean – just defense was absolutely stout on, on, you know, basically from front four and then the back seven were just a really, really good unit. Uh, a lot of pro talent out there. You had a pick in the Peach Bowl and you guys beat an Auburn team that year, which felt like things were going to springboard for, for Coach Bunny. What, what do you remember the most about, uh, about that season? And if, if you have anything specific that you want to share about, uh, you know, your experiences or even that game, feel free. Um, just the, the way that coach Bunnin coached, you know, he just was, he, he played for the university. So it was different. You know, you knew that he, he had a love that was different than most coaches because he was there You know, he was a Tar Heel. So, and from the minute the coach Bunnin, you know, stepped on the, the, um, you know, on the, in the stadium or on the team, he and I formed a bond you know, off the field and stuff like that. We formed a bond and, and I just felt comfortable around coach Bunny. I loved him. I loved, you know, his old stories and things like that that he told, you know, and, and what he stood for. But coach Bunny, you know, was, he was very straightforward. Like, this is what you have to do. You know, you have to do it and let's go. There's no favorites or anything like that. He played the best players and he wanted to win, you know, but he wanted to build character as well. He wants you to be, you know, the best person on and off the field. So just the level of intensity started from the pursuit drills. You know, he was a defensive person. So, you know, he, I mean, tend to kind of stay at our drills all the time. And I, we had a great front seven, you know, but and our secondary was good, but we were kind of out of that front seven. We were probably the the least, you know, I mean, we, we probably struggled the most, you know, because we, it's a passing game. So um, Coach Bunnett stayed over there. We had a great coach, John Tenuta, who came in, and his style, his philosophy was so different from Coach Case. You know, Coach Case, as a senior, I mean, as, you know, I played with Coach Case for four years, and he, he kind of let you do what you do. But Coach John Tenuta came in and would change everything from the beginning. And his whole thing was, I don't like seniors. <laughs> so <laughs> Never heard that was, one. Yeah, you know, so he came in and he loved the like the freshmen. So, you know, I knew that um, if I wanted to to contribute and play for this man, I had to step it up. And everything was a competition every day. Every day was a competition, you know. And coach and coach um, Bunning did a lot of those things as well that you just said about um, the stories and things like that. Coach Bunning loved to hear about your life. He would walk up, hey, come here, Earl, to grab you by that, the side, come here. Yeah. Tell me about you, you know, and I love that about him, you know, because he and I, like I said, we formed a, a bond immediately when he came. So that year was very special, you know, because we started out, you know, we lost a couple of games and then we finally we won this one game. And then all of a sudden it just took off after that. So the, the team um, concept just really clicked in. So let me back up before we before we take a break. You said Dre wasn't a practice guy? Yeah, he was not a practice guy. Dre was always, you know, he, he did well. But <laughs> Dre was almost like, let me go ahead and get this interception. I'm coming to them and let you go in. You know? <laughs> I mean, it was the thing about it. He was a red shirt freshman. You know? I mean, he was the cockiest dude I've seen. In, and, and it just it carried over because I wanted to be like, I'm like, how can this dude be this good? Like, he the way he baited. The receivers, the, the quarterback, 
made him think that he was open, but the relationship he had with like Omar Brown or, um, you know, Reggie Love and those guys was amazing. They trusted him so well to allow him to gamble. And he was a gambler, but yeah, practice, you know, he practiced hard, but you know, he was a gamer. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the only one. I mean, I, I, we heard the stories about Darren Durant was a guy that didn't do much in practice, but could pour it on. But anyway, I just find it funny that. Oh, he did. He did. Stay. He, he practiced well, but you know, he'd say, yo, I'm a gamer. I'm a gamer. You know? <laughs> it, young, I'm, I'm a freshman. I come in, I come in the year before he, he, he had 13 interceptions, you know? So uh, I'm sitting back like, I'm listening to everything he said. <laughs> I'm sitting back like, oh, really? Really? But, you know, he he, he made sure that I practiced, though. You know, he made sure I got all the dummies and and all the um, the extra things that we all were supposed to take back to the group, to the um, to the shed. Dre made sure that I was the one that was carrying him. So, well, that's you know. hilarious. And, and now he's a coach at Carolina. That yeah. is funny. Well, it circles. It, you talk about uh, you talk about being a gamer, and I'll tell you somebody who's a gamer: Johnny T-shirt on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, East Franklin Street, right there for you. If you need them, if you're in town for a game, they got you. If you're in town to drop your son off at college, they got you. If you're in town to drop your daughter off at college, they got you. If you're in town for for a practice, they got you. Johnny T-shirt.com. Johnny T-shirt is owned and operated by UNC Tar Heels. Uh, big time alumni, big time fans of, of all UNC sports programs. If you need the gear, Johnny T-shirt can take care of you. Hit them up. Uh, Inside Carolina premium subscribers know that you get that extra 10% off the top. So get that, use your dime, save some money. And just remember, Johnny T-shirt will take care of you. They've been sponsoring Inside Carolina, including this here podcast for quite some time. We appreciate them. I want you to appreciate them as well. Take a quick break. We're with Errol Hood. Tommy Ashley, yours truly, Joey Powell, doing the 40 Club thing. We'll be right back. Let's national guys pay some ads. We'll talk to you in just one second. All right. Thanks for sticking around, y'all. Listen, we're sitting here with uh, one of the original Rude right now, Errol Hood, uh, with class of 2001 from the University of North Carolina Tar Heel football squad. We talked about his career in, in Carolina Blue. Now we're going to talk about the fun stuff and at least the, the stuff that I think a lot of folks are going to really sink their teeth into. We're going to talk to, to Earl about being a dad of a Tar Heel player, which is anytime, you know, we've never had a chance to really tell that second generation story here on the 40 Club. So I'm excited to do this. Uh, Earl, what's the first thing that you want to share with us about being a, a blue chip recruits father? Like wh when did you when did you realize that that Caleb had a chance to be a good player? When did you realize that, uh, you know, that that this is more than just a kid playing Pop Warner. This is more than just a kid going through the motions on his high school team. Tell us about what that experience has been like for you, at least for when that light came on that you felt like, wow, he might really have a future here. I'm going to tell you, it's going to date back to not even high school. It's going to date back when he was three years old. We were watching, we were watching, he and I and his mom, well, it was probably me, me Caleb and I, and his mom was kind of in and out cooking or whatever. And we was watching this story about this high school kid named Sebastian Tailfeather. He's a basketball player from Staten Island, New York. Mm -hmm. And um, he played um, he played basketball. He was really good. He played, uh, he got drafted from high school. Yep. You know, and he was, his story, we were watching, his story was about him not having what he needed to, to um, be successful. So he used like cans like canned goods and, and things like that to, to as cones. And so Caleb was really listening. So he was talking about doing drills at like three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that, everything, blah, blah, blah. So it was late one night and um, we're in the bed and um, I heard something downstairs around three o'clock in the morning. And Caleb was about three, three or four years old. I get up you know, thinking we're getting robbed. I go to <laughs> and Caleb is downstairs doing drills. He had a little LeBron. Um, three three year old drills, yeah. Yes, drills, <laughs> trying to dribble the ball, you know, in those cones and stuff like that. And at that point right there, I realized that he's gonna be an athlete. You know, he's he's you know, because you got a kid, I mean he always running around playing right was four years old he played soccer and 
he um he if he didn't it wasn't on a team that had UNC colors, he didn't want to play. He <laughs> spat he spatted up his shoes and put a and drew a Nike check. <laughs> and he looked sweet. He he had it, he tied his shirt up in the back, but he would never score a goal. He um always ran the wrong way. And I'm like, Caleb, he's sitting there looking at his shoes. And I'm like, how do we go from you being this kid doing drills to you on the soccer field looking at yourself more than you would kick the ball. So I, I told him I'd switch it up. I said, okay, and this is why I realized he just loved football more than anything. I switched it up and I said, Caleb, if you go out there and you score a goal, I'll buy you a pair of UNC, uh, you know, a helmet, UNC mm -hmm. helmet. And pads. They had them for like $40, the little plastic set. Yeah, like, little Franklin set. Yeah. yeah. He was like, yeah, little Franklin set, little jersey and everything. So Caleb went out there, his second half, he's out there trying to score and something clicked in his head. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to the direction where all my teammates are going and I'm not having any success. So I'm going to go the other way and score and it'll be a lot easier. So Caleb took off running the, the opposite direction. And I'm sitting there <laughs> in the stands like, no, no. <laughs> And he scored a goal, and you would think this little boy won, like, the championship. I'm sitting there embarrassed. <laughs> you know, he's sitting there hyped. The first thing he did is run up to me like, I get my goal. I, I get my um, football helmet and yeah. pad. And I'm sitting there like, no, we're taking you out of this sport. <laughs> They're going to play soccer anymore. So, you know. Oh, but, you know he's going to kill you, right? He's right. going to kill you for sharing these stories. If he shared it, I pull out the video and show people. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're here. This is why we wanted. To, which, by the way, Earl, that's a great callback. I, I'm assuming that uh, that if somebody were to make the same bet with their kid and tell them, like, "Hey, if you do this, we'll get you the little uniform set," they could probably get that a Johnny T-shirt. I appreciate the callback. That was well played. All right. So when Caleb gets to high school, you know, he's at Richmond. Uh, really good quarterback. Talk to us a little bit about how his recruitment started. Like, do you remember the first time that, uh, do you remember the first time maybe that you spoke to, um, you know, to, to someone from a D1 level that was going to be looking at him? Do you remember that? Or how did that go? Or what can you share um, about that? Yeah, you know, um, so Caleb, as a freshman, you know, he started, uh, we, he had a competition kind of like what he's in now. And um, he battled, won the job, you know, he had really good numbers, but he was a quarterback. You know, and um, he didn't – he had good numbers for just a freshman. He didn't have, like, you know, Drake May numbers, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a season. So, um, you know, I, you know, as a dad, I want him to throw more because I'm like, look, I want – the whole point is I want him to get his numbers, his stats up so that he can, you know, receive looks at Carolina. So, um, I think he was there with uh, – who was it? Um, Fedoro. Fedora was a mm -hmm. coach, I think. And so he wasn't, we went to, we went to the camps and stuff like that. You know, he went to quarterback camps and, and all that. And he wasn't really getting the looks that he liked. We liked from who I wanted. I wanted Carolina mm -hmm. the whole time. But I was patient, but he received, I think, um, Wake Forest was on him a lot early, mm -hmm. you know, which is funny because Wake Forest was the first um, school to offer me a scholarship. Well, they were Wait, close to you, yeah. When you yeah. were when you're up in Lenore or in, in Hickory, yes. He um, Wait Forest offered me a scholarship first, and then East Carolina, and so the same type situation happened to Caleb. Mm -hmm. You know, Wait Forest came through, and they liked him and stuff like that. But again, that wasn't Carolina. But I was real patient, you know. So after you know he had had a couple of years, and you know, two years, and he was putting up good numbers. He was getting looks, but he didn't receive an offer. So we're at this little Nike open camp and um, we was at this Nike open camp and um, Caleb had, he was there with the number one running back from Clemson. Um, what's the kid's name? Will Shipley. And he was there and Caleb had put up like some really good numbers. His average is really well, really good. I didn't really understand the camp, what it was up for, but I know he did well. And, the night before, one of our players, um, Jalil um, Davis, 
received a, his first offer. And we all, everybody always thought that Caleb was going to get that first offer, but Jaleel got an offer from South Carolina. And um, I remember his mom coming up to me and she was like, you know, what is, what's wrong? What's Caleb not doing? You know, um, what's Caleb not doing? He's not getting any offer. He's doing really well. And I was like, just be patient. So that night I went out, you know, I think um, Coach Brown had um, got in. I went out and I sent Caleb's film out to every coach on Carolina staff. <laughs> <laughs> Hustling like a father should. Yeah. Every coach on Carolina staff, you know, and I, I wanted them to look. I wanted them to look, you know, and stuff like that. And so, I mean, they can't, they couldn't talk to me, but they could see it was his huddle, you know? And so I think that they kind of opened their eyes. Like he's an athlete, but he didn't, he wasn't a Sam Howell, you know, he wanted, everybody thought he wanted to play quarterback, but what people didn't know was he could care less about playing quarterback in college. He wanted to run the ball, but everybody, Carolina wanted that defensive back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's not, <laughs> But, you know, Coach Bateman, he formed a relationship with Coach Bateman, Coach Bly, um, and loved Coach Brown, you know. And, um, you know, I always told Caleb, I said, you know, this is your decision. Everybody in the world is going to think that you're going to make this decision because of me, but I want you to make this decision because of you because what you're going to realize when you get into college is uh, they're going to get you up at 530 in the morning, and I don't want you to blame me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you gotta get up there. I don't want that to happen. I want you to say, you know what? I made a decision for me. I'm getting up at 530 in the morning because I made this decision to get here, to come here. Not that. So I think that's when it kind of started after that little Nike open camp, you know, and because not long after that, I think uh, in January, um, well, not in January, but I think after that, he, um, Carolina kind of sent him an offer. You know, and when they sent him an offer, it was his first one. He was so happy. I know I was happy, but I, you know, I just try to play cool. Like, yeah, I, I knew, <laughs> you know, but Caleb was so happy, you know, but again, like my dad, when Carolina first sent me that offer, I wanted to sign immediately, you know, and I'm like, just be patient, make sure that, you know, this is what you want to do, you know, um, and stuff like that. And so from day one, I knew that that's where he wanted to go just because of the way that he was raised. Yeah. And I know, yeah, I don't even know if that answered your question. I just kind of went everywhere with it. That's all right. No, it was all – yeah. I, I don't remember Joey's question, so I think you answered it for sure. <laughs> it look, Earl, they're not here to see me. They're not here to see Tommy. They're here to see you, so don't worry about what I said. Well, I can tell you, um, Clayton, my high school here, went down to Richmond County a couple of years ago, and I think Caleb went about 65 on the second snap of the game. And uh, my thought was uh, – that he needs to be in a blue uniform in a couple of years for sure. <laughs> and here we are. Um, what was his experience like down there at Richmond County? I, I mean, back in the Mike Thomas days and all that, Richmond County was stacked and they still are, but it's changed a little bit. How did his high school career go? And you mentioned he just wanted to run the ball, but he was a hell of a quarterback down there for them. Well, he just wanted to run a ball in college. Um, and, and, um, so Caleb, I, Caleb was a running back first when he was um, in Little League. And Kellen, my youngest son, was a quarterback. And um, as well as like Jacoby, who um, – Kobe Baldwin, who was actually – he went to state this year with Caleb. He went to state to play. So uh, we were playing Buddy Maynard. Well, not Buddy Maynard, but like AAU. And, and we were playing against um, a team out of uh, maybe Lee County or um, – Lee County or the Cowboys from Greensboro and Jacoby did not want to play quarterback anymore. He was just like, coach, I don't want to play quarterback. I want to play. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? We're about to play this. You what? So I'm like, we had to make some changes. I'm like, put Caleb at quarterback. Cause Caleb was an athlete, put Caleb at quarterback, put Kellen at receiver, Jacoby at receiver. And this kid named CJ, who was our linebacker, put him at running back and we'll play. Well, we ended up beating that team 40 to zero and they were running their mouth. You know, and so that was a great change. After that, hello. Oh, after that, sorry, Caleb never went back to running back. He played quarterback just the way he led his team, the way that Caleb's not a man of many words on the field. So 
for me to watch him, you know, um, develop and and change those guys and and lead them was just awesome. And I mean, we ended up going undefeated that year at 12 U, being like the number one team in the state and losing in the Super Bowl, you know, to a team that we beat by 30. But after that, he went to middle school and um, everybody in Richmond County was just loving the 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 idea of Caleb becoming a Tar Heel. I mean, not Tar Heel, but a uh, Raider. So I started training him because I knew he was going in for, you know, he was going to go into a battle. Well, our freshman year, his freshman year, the coach um, that was recruiting him, telling him that he's going to start it, he's going to play as a freshman and blah, 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 got fired. So in comes this new coach um, named um, Brian Teal. So after that, we were just sitting back at this moment. I'm like, okay, you know, how can we, I want to keep Caleb because I didn't know much about Coach Teal. I'd heard some good things, but, you know, we wanted to go play for our, my father, Coach Hoggart, in um, Edenton. So, because I felt, I knew that Coach Hoggart would put Caleb in a situation to where he would get him recruited and stuff like that. From that point on, it was all about my son getting recruited. So, we, his mom and I had talked about making that move. Mm -hmm. So, we had, um, we had went down to Edenton. We were looking at houses. We were looking at jobs. I mean, we were the gun set on moving. And then we we're making this decision for us, thinking that it was the best decision for Caleb. And right before, you know, Kathy had found us a house and everything. And then we just sit down one night and we asked Caleb, what do you want to do? And Caleb was like, Dad, I love Papa, but I want to play for the Raiders. Mm. And it was a deal. And so from that point, I said, okay, so now we train. So we started you know, doing, you know, doing a lot of drills and a lot of stuff because, I mean, he couldn't, he had a disadvantage. So that whole off season, you know, they were going through spring ball. There was a senior that he was competing against. That senior had an opportunity because he hadn't played either. That senior had an opportunity to go through spring practice and get a, a jump on Caleb, kind of like what Caleb did now to get a jump on some other kids. And the senior come out of that, you know, being the number one guy. And so I just told Caleb, be patient. We got to compete. So we just worked. You know, I made them go to practices and watch what they did. Let's mentally get an edge so that whenever you do get this opportunity, you're there. You know what to do, you know, just kind of like now. So we battled, we battled, we battled. And then, you know, he kind of over time won that spot. And so from that spot on, I think it lifted his confidence because it takes a special player to play for Richmond County because the fans in Richmond County are kind of different. They love you when you're good and they hate you when you're bad. And you're a kid, you're 16 years old, you're fans in the stands, take him out. He sucks. <laughs> and you in the background looking like that's my child. Say one more word, yeah. you know, so that's the dad side. But luckily I didn't have, I, I didn't have to deal with that, but once in my, um, in Caleb's career, but you know, Caleb was a, He's a studying guy. He spent a lot of his time learning the offense because he really wanted to, to do well because he knew what it took to be a Raider, especially a quarterback. Because if you don't do well there, then they're going to boo you off. I mean, I remember one year um, we played, my dad was there and they played Scotland and Scotland beat them. And the next day, my dad had a U-Haul a in his yard. You know, he had a U-Haul in his yard and people were saying, get out, a for sale sign in his yard. So Caleb grew up seeing those things and he knew he had to compete. So over the years, man, he just stepped it up. And his and, and the coaches, as they coach um, Denson, as he gained confidence in Caleb, he started to open the playbook. And Caleb had a great coach in Coach Jay Jones that coached him in middle school and, and stayed. And Coach Jay Jones knew Caleb. And he, as they started to get him, get more, gain more confidence in Caleb's ability, they opened the playbook up and they realized this kid can run. <laughs> and I mean, the, the thing that when he see, when he saw a hole, pew, he was gone. And I mean, I just, I knew that, you know, he would be a great running back, but I also thought he'd be a good quarterback too on a college level. So he just, he surprised me. Some of the things that he did as an athlete on that field reminded me a lot of what I did, but then I realized real quick, I was, I'm not even on the level that he was on, you know, make, make sure y'all don't, 
share that part with him because he's gonna watch this and be like, "Yeah, Dad, yeah." He's gonna see it. He he gonna see it. But we're gonna remind him about the soccer goal kicking it in the wrong end too. Yeah. So I'm proud of him. You know, um, as I think as fathers, you know, especially athletes, you know, we don't tell our kids, you know, because we're so busy saying yes. That's what I. That's what you're supposed to do. But I I told Caleb. I tell him a lot. You know, I'm proud of you and Kellen for the things that you guys do. Like I'm the biggest fan there. Everybody tell you I'm in the stands. I record every play you know, that he does. And I send it to him after the game. I tell him, I critique him. Look, buddy, what was you thinking when you threw this interception? Or what was you thinking when you ran into this dude? You know, so, um, and he's like, ah, oh, dad, blah, 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 blah. But he he knew that my love was genuine. You know, it was because I cared about him and I wanted him to be great. And I wanted him to be a target. So let me ask the next logical question. How's dad going to feel on September 3rd at about six o'clock when his son runs out on the tunnel wearing a Carolina uniform. Man, I'm going to tell you, I was sitting in the stands uh, during the spring game with my fiance and my brother, and we were watching the, him run out of the tunnel. There's no fan. It wasn't even a game, you know? And I watched him run out and I knew the feeling, the, 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 the stuff that was going through his veins you know, um, I knew that he was, it was, it meant so much to him. And I'm up there with chills in my body. And it was just a spring game. There was no fans. So coming out of Virginia Tech, you know, um, September 3rd, I mean, it's going to be a surreal feeling just to watch to know that, man, you know, my son is, is out there doing his thing. So it's going to be a great feeling. So uh, I want to give you about two more questions and we'll let you go. We're talking with Earl Hood. Uh, University of North Carolina football letter winner and now father of uh, true freshman Caleb Hood, uh, who will be seeing some time in the offensive backfield this year for the Tar Heels. Earl, when when Mac Brown uh, got in, finally got involved with the recruiting piece, or maybe it even was after uh, Caleb had committed. What similarities did you see between when he recruited you? More importantly, what was different? What do you feel like? Uh, Mac had done to refine how he was with his kids. I mean, was it just age and experience had seasoned him a little bit? Do you feel like he was just coming at things from a more relaxed uh, approach? Because I think you have, uh, you have, well, I know you have a unique perspective that a lot of folks haven't seen. And you saw it when you were being recruited, and now you saw him, you know, recruiting your son. So talk a little bit about maybe the similarities and the, the differences between Mac 1.0 and, and, and Mac Brown now. Um, I think, you know, um, being recruited by Coach Brown, I, you know, I talk a lot more to, like, my coordinator. Um, I think it was um, Coach Greg. He was offensive coordinator um, then. And um, Coach Brown had a lot going on during that time because they were ranked really high, you know. And I remember talking to him and, um, you know, just him really just being – I was almost like, a deer with headlights when I met him, just like, I can't believe I'm standing in front of this guy, you know, and he, he had the same expression, you know, you could tell that he was, he was so happy for you to be there. He was so happy to, to have recruited you. And he was so happy that you chose Carolina. But now I think that in this second time around, you know, he, I think he, he just really loves Carolina, you know, I mean, he really loves, you know, what he brings to the kids and and stuff like that because I see a different type person in Coach Brown. I see a uh, he wears like his shoes. He wears the Jordans and <laughs> and you know he's he he gets on the kids level. He didn't do that when I was there. You know he didn't he didn't do that when I was there. You know um, I didn't know him but for so at least half a season. You know because he left after um, you know the season but. He is, like I said, I really like what he does, man. He he does a lot to make the kids feel special. Like, I see him in posters and pictures of kids. He's kind of posted up back. I mean, he's a cool coach, you know. And um, part of me wishes that, you know, we would have stayed a little bit longer and I would have got to play for Coach Brown because, man, I mean, just the stories that, you know, the kid, the guys told that played for him when I was there was just, like, phenomenal, you know. And I was just – I felt very fortunate to – be a part of, you know, the team that he coached in 97, you know, I mean, because just the expect the level of expectation 
was on another level. You know, you just felt different when you, you know, when you played. Even me as a redshirt freshman, just even when I practiced, man, I felt like I was practicing with a bunch of superstars, mm -hmm. you know. And that's that's what you want. You know, you know that this guy, I mean, look at him. He's back in his, what, his second year, third year, and they're in the top ten again. You know, it's funny that my son comes into a program where when I came, we were top ten. Now my son's coming, and they're top ten. Difference is he's playing, and I wasn't. So, I mean, I'm I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity that my son has and, and the, the the coaches that he's surrounded by, Coach Porter and Coach um, Longo. Man, I just – I'm like, man, if we'd have had our defense um, with Coach Longo's offense back when I played, man, it would have been crazy, you know, that we ran the ball a lot when I was um, in college. But they passed the ball and spread them out wide and things like that now. But – I mean, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity that Caleb has. Last question for you, uh, for me as well. Uh, expectations. How does that work as a former player and as a parent? You've got a, a true freshman son that is, is gone. Max already said um, earlier in the week, he's moved up to number two on the depth chart. Obviously, they have Ty Chandler um, that'll be there at that position as a senior, as a grad transfer. So how does one's parent set expectations for their child in this situation? Well, the expectation has always been the same. You do the best that you can do and everything else, handle your business, take care of what you can take care of and what you can control and everything else will fall into place. I expect Caleb to be as good as he is going to be. I expect him to go to practice and work hard. I expect him to go to bed at night, get rest. I expect him to do well in school. I expect for him to study when nobody else is studying. I expect for him to, to stay on the field and do extra drills. You know, he knows when I come, um, when I come to that practice, he knows I, I'll stay there and watch him when the practice is over. He already knows you better be, when everybody's walked to the locker room, you better be grabbing a ball. Cause that was me. I, I stayed after practice. You know, my situation was different. I stayed after practice because I knew I had to be a technician, you know, if I wanted to, to be successful, but, Caleb understands that, you know, from an early age, I just expect for him to do the best that he can, you know, and, and that's competing. Compete at the level that you're used to and, and everything else is going to take care of itself. You know, when um, Caleb entered this competition, you know, when he came into college, it was funny because Caleb made the decision to leave early. You know, me as a father, I wanted him to, stay because I was a selfish decision. I wanted him to stay and play a senior year with Kellen to help his little brother, you know, get, get a scholarship as well because his little brother switched to play in receiver. And I was, I was a little upset. And I was like, I was like, um, you know, I don't know. I don't want you to skip out on your senior season. And then 30 years down the road, you, you were like, man, I could have won a state championship. And the, the answer that Caleb gave me let me know that I had a different son. I said, you know, I want you to, to, to stay and help your little brother get an opportunity to go to school. And he said, Dad, you know, I'm leaving to give Kellen a chance. He won't get a better chance than to be the guy. If I leave, if I stay there, I'm still going to be the guy. But if I leave, Kellen's going to be the guy. He's going to be the quarterback. He's going to be the leader of that mm -hmm. team. And colleges will come in and see that. He said, Dad, I want to go to Carolina and, and get a jump on the competition because that's, that's what I preached. We're going to do these drills to, get, to give you a, a level up on your competition. And for him to throw that back in my face, I couldn't say anything. And he did. He made the decision to go early because he wanted to, you know, go there, learn the position, spend the spring um, getting to know the coaches so that whenever the season started, he won't feel like a freshman. He'll feel like a veteran. And so just to see him go out there and practice and do those things, you know, and, and everything work out the way that he planned, I know that he's got – I know that, you know, everything's going to be okay. Well, that's a heck of a way to, to wrap the show. We appreciate Earl Hood joining us, giving us all this wisdom. He's going from – 
Tar Heel Letterman to now being number one father in the stands this year at Keenan and elsewhere as the Tar Heels travel around on their their schedule this season. Earl, we appreciate you joining us, man. It's like like I said earlier, it's uh it's about you. It's about the stories. Now it's about you and Caleb, and and we're all excited to see what uh, what he's able to do on the field for the Tar Heels. But we appreciate you joining us, man. And uh, hopefully you will uh you'll bump into us sometime as we do not only the Inside Carolina Live radio show this year, but maybe we'll see you at, uh, at Keenan Stadium for a game. But for Tommy Ashley, I'm Joey Powell. This has been the 40 Club on InsideCarolina.com. Big shout out to John Siegley for producing, to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. We appreciate all of you for watching and or listening, and we will catch you sometime down the road. Take care.